Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for waiting. I'm uh, Michael Schindhelm, the curator of this lecture series. This is the second lecture on global culture uh, at the University of the Arts of Zurich. And I'm happy to see so many people here. Uh, thanks to the university, to Thomas Meyer and to Hartmut Wickert, uh, we can host this today at the Theater der Künste in this venue here and in a second venue next door. Um, and I hope that uh, we have a lot of uh, interesting thoughts about uh, architecture and urbanism uh, during this evening. I'm happy to welcome uh, Rem Kolhas, um, the uh, uh, architect, founder of uh, the of uh, Office of Metropolitan Architecture in Rotterdam, um, and Stefan Trubi, who is um, himself uh, the research director of the Biennale this year in summer in Venice, and he is teacher here at the university and also professor for cultural theory and architecture at the Technical University in Munich. I don't think that it is uh, really necessary to um, uh, introduce Rem's biography to you because I s suppose that most of you have heard of Rem Kohlhaas already earlier. Um, Maybe you don't, not everybody of you know that uh, his office uh, won last weekend um, the competition for the Media Lab of Axel Springer uh, Publishing in Berlin. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to seeing you, Ram, getting re-involved in um, the um, debates about um, what the so-called cultural capital of Europe uh, stands for. Uh, and how its public domain reflects the Europeanness of uh, Berlin today. Uh, and I really want to uh, uh, yeah, wish you all the best and congratulate your office uh, to this great success. Um, today, however, we don't speak so much about uh, Berlin. We rather speak about uh, the Biennale in Venice. And I have to say that I'm particularly proud that uh, Rem is talking to us today about this subject because he has not presented his thoughts and concepts uh, before, uh, otherwise than during his uh, tour of press conferences he gave in Venice, Berlin, London, and Paris a couple of weeks ago. So we really enjoy uh, an almost exclusive access to uh, his thoughts on the concept uh, of the Biennale this summer. Um, however, let me just express a few words on uh, Rem's uh, also personality, because I do think that on one hand it is redundant to introduce him here as an architect, because he is a, probably one of the most influential uh, architects of our time, and this already for several decades. And uh, he is also for some time, uh, quite some time, a professor of uh, architectural practice, practice at Harvard. Uh, but I think what is equally important to say is that Ram is not only uh, an important architect, but at the same time, he uh, never rested upon the honors um, he received as an architect, but always tried to push the boundaries of architecture and question uh, sometimes his own business and in particular his own profession. And therefore, it was uh, for me particularly interesting uh, to see what he's going to do with his Biennale. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Rem, you have actually for quite some time not really uh, worked on the uh, architectural Biennale. You were not uh, always uh, too present there. That may also reflect uh, a certain skepticism uh, towards uh, this institution. But at the same time, when you did uh, your exhibition four weeks ago on preservation, it showed that you have a lot to say in this environment and uh, uh, it had an enormous impact on uh, the aspect of preservation uh, in uh, the discussion um, we f uh, have today on that subject. And so I think um, everybody is keen to understand better what you are planning to do this summer. And uh, I want to invite you now as um, somebody who does usually not only speak about architecture but uh, about uh, our social and political condition at the same time, and I think uh, in our conversation afterwards, we will probably touch upon this in greater detail, and therefore maybe the floor is first yours, Rem, but afterwards we have a conversation with Stefan and Rem together. Thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank 
Um, thank you, Michael. It's a wonderful. Can the light uh, be switched off, please? It's a wonderful uh, occasion to try to uh, explain a megalomaniac uh, concept in uh, Zurich, in Switzerland. Um, and I first want to talk to you uh, a little bit about what the uh, Architecture Biennale is and what it has become. Uh, the Art Biennale exists since the 19th century, um, but only in 1980 did they think, have the idea of uh, doing an Architecture Biennale. And as you know now, it alternates with the Art Biennale. Uh, we have in the even years. And by a total coincidence, I was in the first uh, Architecture Biennale, which was actually the first manifestation of postmodernism in architecture. It was called Strada Novissima, the uh, new street. Uh, it was organized by Paolo Portoghese. And as you see here, this is a pavilion of Hans Hollein. Uh, it was a kind of really serious uh, attempt to declare the end of modernism. Uh, and kind of somehow by coincidence, Frank Gehry and myself had opposite houses on this uh, street and we were kind of both extremely surprised and uh, disconcerted that we were in it. Um, these are the kind of titles that have since uh, been the mottos, the themes. And as you can see, uh, if I go through the kind of sequence, uh, there is still, uh, let's say, there is initially uh, an, interest, uh, an interest in urbanism, in European urbanism. Uh, then you see uh, modernity and sacred space. Then, you know, in 96, when uh, architects uh, could really be, have a sense of confidence, sensing the future, the architect is seismograph. I mean, in retrospect, a totally ridiculous uh, 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 title. And then uh, we were punished uh, uh, four years later, uh, less aesthetics, more ethics. Uh, frankly, an equally kind of ridiculous uh, uh, title. And then uh, the safe title next, the incomprehensible title, Metamorph. And then we had the kind of period where uh, basically the um, domination of cities uh, and, and the importance of cities became the core. And then the last one was called uh, Common Ground. Uh, one critique I had, uh, and one reason I tried to stay away as much as possible from these uh, architecture biennales was that they uh, simply adopted the model of the art biennale and became, in the end, uh, 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 occasions for fancy architects to show fancy kind of projects. And the projects became also more and more like art projects, uh, such as this one in 2008. So when I uh, was asked, I nego negotiated two different conditions, and I've been kind of negotiating about this uh, for the past uh, decade. Uh, first of all, that I would have more time. The typical curator has uh, about nine months, and that's simply too short. And the second one, uh, so I negotiated that I would have two, two years. And the second one, and that is perhaps the most important one uh, now for my explanation, is that I could uh, completely cut the ties to the contemporary. So uh, I became director on condition that I did not have to show anything contemporary. Uh, and and uh, so that we could, in one uh, break, uh, break with this uh, similarity between the architecture and the art biennale. Um, more about it later. Uh, there are two components of the Biennale. One is a garden uh, called Giardini, which is the initial part where uh, individual countries have their pavilions. The pavilions are very nice. They started in the late 19th century, so the Biennale is in itself uh, almost an, uh, an exhibition of architecture. And where there is the so-called central pavilion, which was built by the uh, fascists and which is now where the most uh, thematic uh, exhibitions are held. Um, then there's the second part, uh, the so-called uh, Arsenal, uh, which is a former marine establishment and where the dominant building is a 400 meter long uh, rope factory uh, and then some other military complexes. My initial proposal was to close this whole part because I think the banana was too, bo too big, too long, and uh, in a way you were bombarded with so many uh, entities that uh, in the end it becomes impossible to absorb 
but that uh, was uh, not possible. So, uh, I start, let me start with the national pavilions, because one of the uh, inventions, so-called, is that um, uh, by having more time, uh, I could uh, propose and, and could try to convince the individual countries to tell a single story. And that is, in a way, what uh, I have done. This was uh, the last one, where you could see that basically there are so many themes that there is simply no uh, consistency. And therefore, I propose that uh, all the countries uh, tell the same story, absorbing modernity, and that is looking uh, back at the last century. Uh, by coincidence, of course, the year 1914 is a kind of very pregnant year and a very excellent year to, to have that uh, uh, looking back. Uh, initially, people thought it would never work. Uh, the people of the Biennale were very skeptical. But uh, to my own surprise, therefore, uh, actually there was a sense of relief, a relief that uh, they di didn't have to have think about this kind of individual and craft these individual statements, but that what we could do together is uh, collectively tell a single story, a kind of portrait of the last century. Um, and, and this is the rather crude uh, first presentation I made, uh, uh, simply to explain you know, what we could do. And, and I'm happy to report that the kind of reality uh, probably is a lot more subtle. So what I said is 100 years ago, these were individual architectures, and each country could kind of recognize them as such and as their own. 100 years later, this is uh, what we produce. And therefore, uh, we are on our way to uh, kind of similarity and individual uh, characteristics are no longer there. There are hundreds of reasons why this happens. There's war, there's revolution, there's peace, um, there, uh, 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 there's uh, uh, destruction, there's uh, hubris, uh, and, and so uh, that in itself is, of course, uh, crucial uh, to this exhibition. To not have a single narrative architecture is dependent on economy or on artistic movements, but to show the, the uh, intense interaction between architecture and, and events. Sometimes these events are incredibly uh, direct. This is the Russian Revolution, and kind of basically, uh, a couple of years later, Ivan Leonidov, uh, uh, a boy coming from Siberia, turned into uh, the par excellence modern architect that could explain those revolutionary uh, ideas. So sometimes it's uh, enviably direct. Sometimes it's very confusing because uh, these uh, two uh, countries that have thought of themselves as opposite produce the same aesthetic uh, uh, in the same year, uh, America and Russia. Uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, very literal, uh, there's destruction in 1940 and then reconstruction in 1950, uh, and basically in this reconstruction, uh, the modernity uh, takes place, uh, and, and what used to be traditional and historical becomes uh, entirely scraped and modern. Um, one thing that uh, I find particularly fascinating is that, of course, the history of architecture is increasingly polluted, you could say, by the fact that uh, inter a number of international architects kind of uh, built everywhere and therefore uh, bring their own DNA, but in the best cases also engage the e DNA of the situation that they find. I'm very impressed uh, by this uh, single picture, which is the foremost Japanese architect, uh, Kenzo Tange, invited to Saudi Arabia by the king, uh, dressed in Saudi uh, costume, and working on an incredible project for the Hajj, the kind of uh, holy event in uh, Mecca. Uh, where one of the co uh, entities is a visit to, to a valley, uh, and where the king of Arabia, a Muslim, invites a Japanese person to redesign and to conceptualize that event. And so this is the project of uh, Kensutanga, a kind of infrastructure uh, wedged in the um, uh, foothills of a mountain of the mountains. And then kind of when this event takes place, it can become a city for 12 million people temporarily accommodated in that space. 
So what I find beautiful about this episode is that it kind of suggests that at some point there was a sophistication in uh, in in the client, let's say, in the relationship between clients and architects, and also an openness to uh, an architect from a totally different world to uh, operate uh, in the holiest of holy uh, countries. Uh, and obviously, in the current uh, condition of the world, I'm not saying of the Arab world, but of the world in general, such an exchange is hardly possible. Uh, China, what is uh, very important, of course, and implied in my invitation, is to not the triumphal march of modernism, but absorbing modernism almost like body blows uh, a boxer, uh, f from all sides, modernity is injected and kind of it's really the response of the different cu uh, cultures to these body blows. And also there is, of course, in every case, uh, uh, still a very strong resistance. This is uh, a, a Chinese architect who is still uh, working with the Chinese wolf as a, almost an emblem of defiance. Uh, this is Holland, but this is also Holland. Uh, so. And, and the more there is of this, probably the more there is of this. Uh, uh, I uh, am confident that the same happens in uh, in your country uh, also uh, uh, in a very kind of precise way. Now, this was my uh, argument, uh, and we, we have the first uh, evidence back uh, of uh, what the individual countries are showing. And because we are covering uh, an, uh, a century, we are extracting kind of from all their contributions a kind of portrait of the century. And I'm not showing you the hundred uh, episodes that we illustrate, but what is very interesting to me is, and what was a kind of realization that came after, um, is how incredibly, because frankly speaking, I was not convinced of the relevance of the individual country as a lens to look uh, at the 20th century, and therefore uh, was uh, quite worried that the model of the Biennale based on individual countries could be outdated. But actually what turns out to be the case is that by uh, looking at the century through the uh, eyes of individual countries, uh, first of all, there are many, so it's a kind of multifaceted look, uh, more than 70 countries will participate, including for the first time a number of African countries and also Iran will take uh, place. And the South Korean pavilion is about North Korea. So there's a lot of um, interesting kind of uh, exchange and newness in that sense. But uh, what was interesting to me to realize is how incredibly violent the uh, histories of all countries had been this century. And of course, we know that the 20th century has been very violent, but if you look at individual countries, it turns out that each of them has been kind of destroyed, divided, kind of rebuilt, uh, reinvented, rebranded, uh, annexed, uh, and that actually an unbelievable political transformation is perhaps one of the key uh, uh, entities. So here, you see, this is a project in France by Lotz, which uh, at the same time is uh, presented typically as a fantastic example of prefabrication. But what is not said typically is that during the war it was used as a concentration camp. Uh, so the, what we are getting is not the kind of emphasis on the kind of uh, prefabrication, but on on the concentration camp in a kind of famous modernistic uh, icon. Um, what we get from America is uh, very interesting. Also, the, the architecture uh, of the Cold War and how Cold War became uh, a pretext, of course, for the Soviets to be uh, work on propaganda. But what we typically forget is that also the West used architecture for propaganda. And this is uh, an interesting uh, early example of how American architecture was going to be organized. This is the Kahn organization, uh, the architecture of Arthur Kahn, Albert Kahn, sorry, Albert Kahn, uh, in 1942. Uh, working a lot for the war effort, creating incredibly big um, 
uh, factories uh, and actually very beautiful abstract uh, spaces. But basically, there's, this is really a breakthrough that an architectural office can be presented as a kind of business and management uh, diagram, uh, of course. And so typically, our history books are kind of hopeless in showing uh, these kind of dimensions of the profession and also these kind of transformations uh, of the pr profession. So you can also see the United States present kind of Fidel, Fidel Castro on the roof of the Hilton in Havana, uh, having a good time uh, instead of the dictator uh, he in the kind of fantasy of America uh, uh, now is. Um, we see Canada kind of radically changing the uh, north, uh, the Arctic Circle, and and being uh, quite uh, radical in in how far they go. They're kind of both in terms of the implementation of infrastructure. We see Kuwait uh, designating things. Uh, heritage uh, uh, just moments because they would uh, disappear anyway. So a kind of fabrication of identities of many kinds, either in, in the uh, new territories or in old uh, and traditional uh, environments. You see also uh, fantastic uh, things that perhaps we now look at as, as mistakes or at least a, ambiguous kind of feelings about, but uh, uh, these are the Nordic countries that are kind of simply showing their efforts uh, at construction in Africa. And it goes from the kind of slightly dubious like fish factories in a kind of a, a desert in Africa where nobody has ever seen a fish, but also uh, at much more kind of respectable kind of efforts at improving education, building schools, uh, uh, supporting socialism. So here again, this is for me a, a really beautiful image in terms of its almost innocent collaboration, uh, unhindered by political correctness or all the subsequent uh, alibis for doubt uh, that we have since then kind of burdened this kind of image with or this kind of process with. Um, this is Belgium. Belgium has a kind of very uh, surreptitious uh, strategy. They only show interiors. Uh, and they show the the changes in kind of regular interiors and and uh, kind of in a certain way it's kind of horribly horribly eloquent uh, uh, for that country. Um, uh, one year later, we have Germany, the councillor villa in Bonn, uh, now a completely uh, forgotten episode, of course, with the capital of Berlin. But here, how a bungalow. Uh, could become the core of uh, a new uh, uh, West German state, but also a kind of mise-en-scene, play a big role in mise-en-scene. Uh, here, the Canadians going further and further in kind of transforming the uh, their Arctic Circle, uh, very often at the expense of the original inhabitants. We see the ghastly distortion that on the one hand, the uh, prescrip prescription of vernacular architecture, and on the other hand, the demands of tourism create in creating on some of the most beautiful places in the world um, uh, hybrids of uh, wellness and vernacular uh, that that are uh, really implausible, and that you know under the guise of respect uh, actually create more destruction and more havoc than modernity ever did. Um, again, the further but now mediated uh, extension of the Canadian presence in the Arctic North. So you see, for instance, it's a beautiful thing. You know, first, there's radar, then there are kind of settlements, and then there are kind of media and politics. Uh, and in that sense, uh, it's a fascinating uh, uh, narrative in a way. And it's particularly fascinating because it is all kind of things that in, I do not personally know any uh, of our uh, histories or any of our kind of recent debates or any of our recent discourse has ever talked about. One of the most disconcerting uh, uh, discoveries, and that was a discovery, discovery after the fact, nobody intended uh, to do it, and I certainly didn't recommend it necessarily, but that 
all these 70 countries talking about the last century, none of them is talking about an important architect. So it's a kind of very uh, reassuring uh, evidence of uh, the modest role uh, we have played uh, in uh, destroying the world. Uh, okay, so now, sorry, I have to... Um, so this is uh, perhaps the most uh, most important part. I don't know. In retrospect, uh, I, I am at this point not sure of the effect of anything in reality that uh, I now describe. Uh, I keep my fingers crossed for each uh, element, but I'll, I'll, there will are three. Uh, so the the combined message of all the individual countries. The central pavilion is something that uh, I am doing myself with my office anymore uh, and with a number of uh, thinkers, uh, and Stefan Truby is one of them. Uh, and what we are trying to do here is just as we look at the century through the lens of individual countries, we're looking at architecture and the history of architecture, but of course more the transformation of architecture through the lens of uh, individual elements of architecture. Uh, elements as banal as wall, uh, floor, ceiling, uh, bathroom, heating, uh, etc. Uh, but we, ha we had an ins instinct and uh, an intuition that basically looking at these uh, elements, we would discover perhaps aspects or realities about architecture that uh, are hard to capture and that uh, uh, always elude us, and particularly an understanding of architecture that is more uh, connected to what actually happened than the official history of our transformations. Um, I already mentioned, mentioned Stefan Truby. Uh, I was encouraged in doing this when I met him uh, and uh, heard that he was doing uh, a PhD on the history of the corridor Another friend, uh, almost at the same time, was doing a history of the full ceiling, also not something uh, officially kind of part of architectural history. But basically, these two uh, encounters uh, reinforced my instinct that uh, it would be worth uh, to try at least to look at architecture in that way. And that became the basis then of uh, a book, Elements of Architecture, and a an, uh, show, Elements of Architecture. It's in the uh, pavilion, Fresh's pavilion. Can basically, it's a very simple exhibition. It takes every element, uh, every room, and dedicates the room to an element. So ceiling, uh, corridor, floor, facade. And I will take you kind of very quickly in kind of how we are trying to do that. The book uh, is a book that uh, uh, has a kind of horrible tendency to become uh, uh, thicker and thicker. Uh, and, and so it will probably, its si eventual size is defined by the deadline of the publisher, um, uh, which is very imminent. Uh, uh, and um, so th what we will do is that the, the elements uh, will each be uh, kind of present in each of the rooms and there will also be a kind of presence of the kind of research in a way that snakes go through all the rooms. Now. You, might, you could wonder, you know, why look at elements, but uh, for instance, this is evidence that uh, the history of the world would look totally different without a balcony. Uh, and, uh, and, and the more you look at balconies, the more you realize the, the, incredibly, uh, the incredible importance they've had. You see that kind of certain Arabic and Indian cities are all balcony, and that the balcony is kind of perhaps the most kind of visible layer of it, or the most important interaction between the interior and the exterior. So the balcony is not uh, per se the kind of debased uh, thing that we know. But here, this is a recent picture of Dubai, where we still see that in a kind of crazy kind of Western aesthetic, as Dubai, the balcony still plays a kind of very important role. Uh, and here we were kind of simply trying to uh, discover signs of life, and in the end we gave up and we uh, I tried to identify signs of irregularity, uh, assuming that irregularity eventually would coincide with life. 
so it speaks for itself, uh, irregularity, and you see, you know, the, the sequence of a city, a cities being kind of incredibly animated and cities being animated in a kind of radically different way. If you look at the ceiling, the history of its ceiling, you see that at some point it's uh, an incredibly important iconographic plane on which uh, both uh, aesthetic ideals and, and mythologies are projected. And But maybe this is also an, uh, uh, a form of communication. Uh, and maybe uh, this is also iconography, and maybe we need the uh, iconography of rationality to uh, give us comfort about the insanity of uh, a lot of the activities that, that are taking place in our offices. Um, doors, uh, and, and we're looking at across different cultures, so you could say you could specify the individual qualities of these doors, but you could also say that it's ironic that they're all more or less the same site, size, more or less the same uh, iconography is more or less uh, functional, but at the same time clearly symbolic, and that we end now in a kind of slightly kind of disappointing uh, aluminum frame. Uh, but then again, if you look at, for instance, procedures such as airports, you could also see maybe there's a certain richness in this kind of very slow progression uh, with all its irritations, uh, gives us also um, ultimately a kind of profound sense of transition. Uh, in order to modify the, the kinds of experience, we have a window, the window also ended like an aluminum frame. So we have a real factory in place that makes real windows uh, there uh, with an incredible noise uh, and a kind of robot uh, that tests them. Uh, and, and this is a contribution of Stefan Turby. Uh, Stefan, I hope I don't caricature uh, your uh, Professor Milke. Uh, the world expert on staircases too much, uh, kind of uh, born in 1921, yeah, uh, still alive, uh, and uh, somebody who uh, wrote 50 books on staircases, kind of measured almost the uh, most important staircases of the world, kind of personally, knows all the kind of implications of every angle, uh, every width, in terms of hierarchies or kind of former uh, procedures uh, for which they were mentioned. And so in Venice, we are uh, very lucky that with the entire archive, including balustrades, uh, in place uh, to uh, be able to understand uh, the beauty of it. Um, we also have, and, and this, this is totally unplanned, but what we discovered that the greatest expert on staircases was born in 21, and the two greatest experts on the ramp were born two years later. One is the French architect uh, Claude Perrin, the second is the American uh, Tim Nugent. And this is for me a kind of very moving episode because the man on the right, Claude Perrin, uh, wanted the ramp to be steeper and steeper. Uh, and he developed a kind of theory that own, that to live on a flat floor was uh, profoundly unadventurous, uh, and that uh, it was really necessary to challenge yourself by living under an angle. And he proposed a kind of radical series of angles uh, uh, under which uh, people lived. The American uh, was involved in a war and then confronted with... Uh, many people uh, in wheelchairs, handicapped people in wheelchairs, and dedicated his life to impose uh, handicapped access on the world. So one wanted it like this, and the other wanted it flatter and flatter. And for me, there's a not only metaphorical uh, stretch in these two, or polarity in these two positions. Obviously, architecture is constantly uh, aspirational. Uh, but also constantly dampening. Uh, and I think that we are kind of right now in a kind of period of dampening. We actually discovered, for instance, that staircases are becoming less and less steep because our generations, uh, new generations, are apparently kind of unwilling to uh, uh, spend uh, uh, energy on, on steep chairs and, and more and more uh, used to comfort 
and to unchallenging uh, conditions. And I think that the, the polarity in architecture between challenge and unchallenging is kind of perhaps one of the most profound ones. And uh, we would never have been able to grasp this point in all its uh, starkness if we had not uh, kind of really looked at the two elements. So here we see Claude Parent living his, with his wife and researchers on uh, uh, an, an uh, oblique and, and talking to researchers uh, that are asking kind of for, the, for a report about the experiences. Uh, it was quite uh, it, uh, difficult to, to find the position. So you here see, see kind of little piece of uh, animal skin that kind of kept you stable on this uh, uh, condition. And here you see the kind of work uh, of the handicapped access. Uh, and here you see a kind of small uh, sketch by Perrin claiming that the maximum angle that people could uh, inhabit was 50 degrees. Uh, and that, that is kind of really close to... Uh, and here there is the nugent uh, uh, angle uh, that uh, is now uh, imposed on the entire world uh, in the name of handicapped uh, access, uh, and which is even flatter than uh, in even Nugent uh, 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 suggested. Um, I could go on and on, uh, but I, I won't do that except to say that, for instance, uh, uh, we tra translated the Chinese uh, manifesto of the 11th century uh, about building and kind of rebuilt, uh, according to their rules, uh, a Chinese roof. And you can look at this, uh, and we did initially, you know, as, as a typical uh, uh, evidence of uh, China's kind of reluctance to invent uh, and uh, China's uh, kind of insistence that types do not necessarily, that types could be permanent and don't need to change. In other words, a kind of, uh, uh, an anti-modern position that not everything has to change. But when we translated and kind of really looked uh, kind of very carefully, we discovered also that it was a threat against uh, corruption, so that basically you know no uh, contractor could ever charge more. But that also embedded in the complexity of this, there was a number of elements that could be eliminated without damaging to the uh, to the uh, integrity of the piece. Uh, and that therefore there was a kind of uh, premonition of value engineering. Um, so, in other words, uh, what seemed at first sight a kind of dogmatic uh, model uh, actually turns out to be something that kind of politically deals with issues that we are currently deeply uh, involved in and that we actually don't have a handle uh, on. Uh, so with, with this uh, thinking, the Elba Symphony would never have happened. Uh, uh, so uh, I am at the end of half an hour of conversation, so I'll, I'll keep the next uh, thing very short. The third element is called Monditalia. Uh, it is uh, spanning the entire uh, arsenale, and uh, it is based on a kind of Roman map of Italy, uh, which was uh, fitted exactly, uh, kind of here, see the heel, uh, this is north, and which interestingly enough uh, has kind of everything that uh, makes Italy, uh, Italy now, all the roads, all the cities uh, are present in this map. I'm uh, a huge uh, supporter of Italy and the whole idea of Italy. And so what I wanted, to, for me, the current situation in Italy is very emblematic for situations that we're all facing, with on the one hand uh, enormous potentials that are blatant, on the other hand incredible problems that are equally blatant, and a strange inability to uh, turn the potentials into reality and to get rid of the kind of problems. Uh, and I think uh, this is maybe most visible in Italy and maybe uh, Italy's uh, qualities and potentials are also uh, exceptional, uh, but I would say that a country like uh, Holland or a country like uh, kind of Switzerland are currently kind of exactly on the same cusp. So uh, it became interesting for us to simply make a representation of Italy uh, through various media uh, that uh, uh, talk about this condition. 
So you see, th this is a backdrop uh, through the entire country. This was a kind of early kind of part of the set, but it's also uh, attractive and unique, and which is the response when I said we should close the arsenal. Architecture cannot fill everything. We then uh, discuss, talk to all the other biennales, the dance biennale, the theater biennale, the music biennale, and the cinema biennale, and decided on a collaboration. So all these biennales will be held in the Monte Italia, and there will be in, in kind of various periods that you see here, and then there will be a permanent presence of architecture and a permanent in the form of 50 different projects and a permanent presence of cinema uh, in, the pres in the form of 80 different mo Italian movies. And the net result uh, of that will be a kind of scan, uh, and that is the intention, a scan of Italy. Italy is a country where artists and architects uh, have a kind of very deep uh, regional uh, engagement, and so many Italian movies, in addition to the subject, are also about a particular region or about a particular city. So in this way, kind of moving through the arsenale in a linear way, you have a kind of sense of the whole of Italy uh, kind of through many different uh, uh, periods. Uh, and you will always have a kind of sense of uh, the two uh, shown together. So this is a kind of image of the catalog, for instance. Here the movies, and here the architecture. And kind of very often, you know, the two, again, without too much manipulation, uh, almost completely coincide. Uh, so that is then a kind of gesture uh, of uh, showing how architecture can uh, step out of its uh, limitations and ghetto. There's only one more thing to say, is that there is also, uh, during the entire six-month-long Biennale, it's exceptionally long, there will also be uh, a number of events, seminars, and, and educational moments uh, that are partly uh, uh, have participants on this front row, partly organized by Michael Shinto, uh, uh, by Stefan Truby, uh, by others, so that uh, there is a constant uh, activity of that. So this is the Biennale uh, in its, uh, as it is now planned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rem. There's, of course, a lot to uh, talk about now, and uh, I think um, we should also, at some point, uh, let uh, the audience participate in this conversation. There will be microphones later uh, uh, handy for uh, your participation. Um, Rem, you, um, you, um, it's, uh, when you present these three chapters of, of your approach, um, it's, uh, it looks as if you have, on one hand, uh, looked back in the political history, in particular of Europe. Uh, you have looked back in the history of uh, the elements of architecture. And you have um, the idea of focusing on the uh, political and social condition of a, single, of, of a particular country in Europe, with Monte Italia, and its, of course, context uh, with the world. Um, you could say three times you somehow reject um, the expectation of um, dealing with the contemporary and dealing with the global. Uh, I suppose that uh, this is uh, on purpose. And um, you already in the beginning of your talk referred to the beginning of the architectural biennale of the history, uh, sort of uh, announcing the end of modernism. Uh, your first chapter speaks about absorbing modernity, and I wonder if um, it is also an attempt to somehow defend modernity. Um, could you maybe well, with, the, with the microphone? Yeah. 
Uh, I, I think uh, modernity is, uh, and, and that's why uh, I talk about uh, modernity. I think that modernism is a name uh, of a artistic movement that uh, either needs defense or that can be attacked. But I think that modernity is a condition that uh, is largely independent uh, of that artistic movement and that uh, <coughs> can maybe be attacked. Uh, but I don't think it can be defended, uh, per se. Uh, I think it is uh, fundamentally what happens uh, as a kind of outcome of our uh, current political, uh, economic and uh, conceptual or, or cultural kind of world. And uh, uh, I, I think the, the idea that you could attack it uh, is uh, in, in a way futile. But at the same time, it remains very important to understand it because I think you can do things within it uh, that perhaps uh, establish uh, positive things in a kind of larger thing where you really have to question whether it is positive or, or negative. Um, but. Um I mean, you, you present also um, a certain uh, diversity. Um, we, we talk about, uh, we talk a lot today about uh, the uh, convergence uh, of features in, in uh, many uh, expressions, among others also architecture uh, globally. And um, you actually talk a lot about diversity here. You speak about uh, still um, the existence of certain notions of uh, differences in the development and understanding of architecture and also of the development of elements. At least is what you seem to expect from uh, what the, the participants from the national pavilions uh, could provide us with. So um, I, I would like to know, is the, is the matrix of class, uh, classification the national aspect? Because it, it, it in the beginning at least looked like this, as if you would expect that there, there's still um, a particular emphasis in the differentiation on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the national uh, background, or is, is there something else? I think that uh, you, you talk to me as if uh, I'm an entirely kind of rational person uh, who's uh, always in control of uh, his, his intentions. Uh, but that is not I'm the case. I apologize. Uh, no, <laughs> no that, that is definitely not the case. Uh, uh, and, and particularly in this case, uh, uh, once you're asked, uh, of course you need a plan, uh, but the plan was largely um, largely uh, intuitive and to some extent uh, kind of highly improvised. In other words, the Monte Italia thing was a last minute kind of idea given the fact that um, uh, they didn't want to close it. And, and I'm kind of very happy uh, with it. So the, the improvisation is a kind of really key aspect. Also, what is very important to uh, kind of realize is that I could only kind of suggest to the national uh, countries and, and absolutely not um, uh, impose. Uh, and uh, also, because I guess that we, because I made it very clear that I was not interested in imposing something that it was an incentive to uh, embrace the notion uh, of doing it. Uh, so, uh, since most of the kind of messages are in uh, only kind of recently, I now begin to get a kind of sense of what maybe the total could could imply uh, uh, in itself, and um, uh, and it's too early. And, and plus, I think that it will not be. That is the attractive thing about this. It will not be a conclusion or an editing that we in the end will do. It is kind of really a situation where everyone can draw their own conclusion. But I do think that uh, certain themes uh, will, will, will be kind of very evident. And one theme is a kind of heroism of, of many uh, kind of nations and conversely uh, a kind of profound lack of heroism in the kind of current moment maybe. Yeah? Whether it is heroism in terms of uh, steepness of staircases or uh, heroism of uh, uh, going on a kind of mission impossible to Africa. Uh, the whole idea of a mission impossible uh, and the, the whole notion of a very uh, steep slope on which you live, all of those things seem to be 
to have been abandoned. And uh, one more thing, what, what has also in terms of improvisation uh, been actually very exciting, uh, and you are the witness uh, to the fact that in the beginning we knew that we wanted to do this thing, but we did not uh, necessarily uh, know why. And somewhere halfway we started a kind of anxious discussions uh, in terms of uh, to construct the, uh, the argument for it. Uh, and uh, uh, we are now in a kind of semi-luxurious position that the argument is simply emerging. And um, I'm, I'm particularly excited to say that um, what we, uh, shall I go on with this uh, kind of elements of architecture? Uh, it, what, what I think is the most, um, who, how many architects are there in this room? Uh, 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 not that many. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, um, that, so that, that is on the one hand very exciting, but we can maybe uh, what I have to say now is kind of falling on uh, flat ears. But uh, if you look at the history of architecture, um, for, we, first of all, our history is very old. Yeah, we learn about the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, how they do things and how they introduce things like symmetry and kind of relationships, and that, that is what our profession is about. But then in the 19th century, there were a lot of uh, inventions uh, that actually influenced architecture and influenced all the elements. Uh, such as uh, the escalator, a staircase became uh, an escalator. And so it still has elements of the architecture, uh, but it is also a machine. And in a way, we were, architecture was never able to make sense out of that phenomenon, and they never admitted it to the core of architectural discourse. So that is why in 1980, they could still go back to the earlier times you know, where all of those things would not happen. If you look at the book of the language of postmodern architecture uh, by Charles Jenks, published in the early 80s or late 70s? Mid 70s. Yeah, mid 70s. Then the word ele elevator does not appear in it. Yeah? And, and all a whole series of words that we are looking at simply doesn't appear. Now, we are in the kind of uh, interesting moment uh, where we are, are about to embark in a new phase, and that is the phase where all those kind of mechanical events uh, are taking their revenge. Uh, I'm giving you a simplified version uh, for amateurs. Um, because, uh, for instance, uh, we have now uh, uh, kind of garage doors that you can open with your mobile. We have uh, kind of basically uh, regulations of the house that you can completely set again from your mobile. You can warn your house that uh, uh, you arrive uh, at uh, seven o'clock in the, the evening. And if you're smart, you can also warn your house that you will probably get up at seven in the morning. Uh, you have fridges that can warn you that uh, you're running out of milk. And basically, there is a kind of lot of uh, devices that you can kind of talk to and that ask you to talk to them uh, and to interact with And I think uh, it, a wonderful uh, moment happened just before uh, or somewhere before we were finished, that, which is Snowden. And, and kind of Snowden kind of really, uh, I think, uh, in a very effective way, alerted uh, the entire world that uh, data are not as innocent uh, as they seem. And so uh, what, what is kind of really interesting about the, the elements of architecture show is that we are perhaps in the last moments before data take over. And I, in the press conference, I put it uh, melodramatically, uh, soon your house will betray you. Uh, and and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, that, in a way, gave the kind of raison d'etre that uh, we were looking for in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, Stefan, uh, I suppose that you were um, in particular involved in the development of the elements uh, part. 
Um, looking at this, there's, um, you're trying to achieve a typology uh, of uh, elements of architecture. Again, looking uh, back in time, um, what is it? Um, is it? Is it? Uh, if you look at the whole thing, is it rather, um, let me say, a sum of uh, different types of elements, or is there something overriding which uh, adds to? this kind of uh, summar uh, summarizing uh, the elements. Is there something uh, like a combination uh, or like a hyper uh, narrative uh, over the elements, or is it just the elements? I think some of the um, kind of general developments uh, Ram mentioned already, this fate in uh, the digital culture of at, uh, not all, but most of the elements. Um, but uh, I would like to come back for one second to, to what Ram said about the amateur. I think, in, from my experience, when I, you, you mentioned this uh, research work or this book on the corridor, uh, I made the experience that um, that actually not very, not many architects are interested in corridors. I found out, but many filmmakers, m many writers are interested in that topic. So I think um, the, um, this is, uh, I think, great news that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, these topics are also uh, interesting for amateurs. I think uh, what the, the, one of the main problems in the architecture biennale is, at least in my observation uh, throughout the last couple of years, was that I very often had the impression that these architecture biennales are just for architects and uh, there's no point for non-architects to go through them because they either see uh, um, pseudo art or they see representation of buildings that are not there in a way. Uh, so uh, what uh, what we evolved within this Biennale and especially during the Elements show is, is a way of talking about architecture through the lens of elements, not through the names of architects, not through the names of architects, but through stuff that surrounds everybody. And um, uh, I th what we are trying to do, and I would like to come back to this word hero uh, that Ram mentioned, um, w in some parts I think we achieved to find heroes of elements. Uh, Friedrich Milke, who was mentioned already, is one of them. What uh, uh, Ram didn't mention is, um, I don't want to sound distasteful or, or something like that, but he has one leg. Um, and uh, I, th I was... Uh, the, the, the staircase researcher, uh, the staircase re researcher Ram mentioned, is one leg. He came back from the Second World War with only one leg, and um, uh, I think that that's an amazing story of a life to 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 um, to research as a kind of uh, to combine masochism with with uh, with architectural research, and, and to to measure staircases with with constant pain. And um, I think these are moments where you can really tell a story of architecture um, that might be interesting for everybody. But uh, just uh, yeah, coming back to this point of heroism and what Rem mentioned before already, things have become more and more comfortable over the last uh, 100, 150 years or so. Uh, for me, it's still a question: What does uh, what is what is your uh, consequence? Uh, do you think that we should have a more challenging design again? Mm. Well, I think in, in, no. Uh, I could say no, or I could say yes. Um, uh, of course, there is still challenging design, uh, and and uh, uh, if you're a challenging challenging designer, uh, unfortunately, you always uh, discover that there are kind of uh, some pressure to not be challenging, but it's not uh, that, uh, that that kind of impulse has completely died. It's still very much alive. I mean, people are challenging ideas kind of all the time, propose uh, challenging ideas. But I think that um, the, the metaphor or looking at it kind of, for instance, through the ramp is very productive because what you see on the one hand, you see uh, a number of challengers kind of being kind of more or less successful, kind of, uh, creating really exciting episodes, uh, being uh, uh, having an influence uh, in terms of name. On the other hand, you see that the kind of reality of the world is kind of now uh, has massively adjusted uh, to, to the other version. So um, I see it more in terms of a, c a constant striving uh, that you know will will def that is not endangered in itself, 
But on the other hand, I see that um, if, if, you, if, if architecture becomes uh, part of political correctness, as it is in the case of the ramp, then I see a kind of situation where um, the very diversity of the world and the very diversity of different religions and uh, political systems could easily lead to the adoption of the few uh, polite elements that we all agree on, i.e. handicapped access is somebody where uh, a Chinese politician or an Iman or uh, uh, somebody from the Crimea or somebody from America would would easily agree on. So I think uh, that the danger is not so much, about, uh, let's say, the tension between exceptions and the rule, but that the certain rules will become uh, kind of really incredibly harsh and hard to dislodge. And, and for instance, if you have a house with a thermostat and if all the kind of... Uh, big data uh, are uh, combined and if uh, the consensus about sustainability and how we have to take that seriously and greenness, uh, blah, blah, that at some point you could get a kind of, you know, your thermostat telling you, you have to go to bed now or pay a penalty or, uh, and uh, I don't know whether anyone has seen the kind of the article of Nicholas Mack uh, about cars in the Frankfurt Allgemeine where you have a car that that detects uh, kind of irregular driving and then tells you to take a break with a kind of emblem of a co cup of coffee. Two hours later, you have an accident, and basically the insurance company tells you, yeah, but you didn't have a coffee, so, uh, so we're not paying. So I, I, I think that can be, it's not difficult to imagine that that becomes a kind of very uh, heavy, heavy burden, I would say. So that's why uh, I would like to know, is this already part of your elements uh, um, uh, exhibition, the, the, this kind of introduction of uh, intelligence and uh, the digitalization of certain elements? Is this, is this, is this part? You, you, you can see it. Yeah. Mm. Um, before I... We are not warning, but we are... We are anyway alerted, but it would be... An, a, I think this is... A, uh, certainly a subject uh, which uh, would uh, need further research also because um, I do think that um, the the possibility of uh, becoming uh, a victim of your own intelligence system is actually uh, quite uh, high. Um, I, I just want to, in the end, um, before we actually open uh, to the public, ask you one more question and actually come back to the first question. And this is uh, maybe the two of you also. Um, so you somehow um, exclude the contemporary, uh, uh, somehow, uh, seemingly, uh, no, of your... Not, not in elements, because in elements we, we're dealing with it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just wonder, um, there's, there's still at least this kind of notion that you look back, first and foremost, you, you actually try to uh, go back in time and to make a, ris a historical overview. And um, I wonder if... There's something um, like a message also on what does this mean to us uh, today and the way how we actually look forward. Or we, we, we should look forward. Well, I, I would say that um, um, one of the messages of the show could be that, uh, of course, we look at the floor, we look at the wall, we look at windows, etc. But what happens if uh, the wall looks at you, and what happens if uh, if the floor looks at you? And I think uh, this this uncanny situation of things looking back at you, uh, hopefully uh, emerge in some of the rooms when we uh, discover um, uh, certain characters, certain stories. I think what what we we are trying to do, at least in some of the spaces, is uh, of course we deal with history, but uh, this history embraces the contemporary and also the future. And um, uh, I think uh, we, we, uh, we are trying to communicate a fascinating part of history with a story. Uh, yeah, I think that the historical part, you know, in, in retrospect, is uh, less uh, dominant uh, of the whole thing. And, and uh, the disconnection from the contemporary is maybe less uh, successful than we thought in the beginning. But in any case, we wanted to go from 1914 to now. 
And so uh, we, with the elements, we go at least till now and then kind of also into the future. So it's not an aggressive uh, distance, but it's simply uh, looking at the present uh, with a kind of very uh, informed uh, way that is, and, and maybe that is a critique on the current moment where we seem to live in a present that has no past. Uh, we are kind of really look, trying to look at a present that has a past. Yeah. And, um, I, I insist a bit on this point because I think um, uh, there is a, a kind of hidden message, of course, to the to the future in it, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. We will discover it uh, from June onwards when we uh, see the outcome of uh, your effort. Thank you very much so far for this conversation and uh, for your uh, talk before. Uh, now I would like to uh, open the floor for the audience and uh, we have, as I mentioned already, two microphones here in uh, the auditorium. So please, uh, who wants to say something in the last row, that's very comfortable to start with. Uh, who, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a challenging design, interactive design. Hello, hello. Grüezi, <laughs> Rem. Um, I have three questions, uh, very quick. Uh, when you showed the diagram of uh, Albert Kahn, I wonder whether the reorganization of Albert Kahn's office, uh, this idea of organizing or design by organizing, uh, speaks to you today uh, in the contemporary society through your project of reorganizing basically the Biennale. So I wonder what what does it mean to compare um, Kant's uh, abstract reorganization of practice with the reorganization of the Biennale today? And then I have a second question. Uh, and I would like to understand in these uh, in this, in this gardens, in these uh, uh, national pavilions, uh, there is a hundred year history. But that hundred year history for me doesn't represent the actor of that 100-year history also as a client, let's say, for architects, that is international institutions, the UN, the League of Nations, uh, the European Union, and then also international and multinational corporations. So I wonder whether this self-critique of nations at the end could have spoken also to uh, international agents that somehow maybe are present but uh, in the backyards. And then uh, I have a. Th I, I didn't understand the key word. Could have what? Yeah, you said uh, whether this uh, kind of impulse of the individual nations could have also regarded. The I wonder. Yeah, I wonder how did you what recognize the, the presence of these international agents? Uh, because they, they they became not only international institutions, non-governmental institutions, but also multinational corporations, as they shaped uh, and they create meaning to our world besides the, um, some say, declining power of, uh, of nation states for creating meaning. And the third question I have is regarding the, uh, and then I'm, I'm, I'm finishing, <laughs> and then it's, it's, it's really related with the issue of, of, of creating contemporaneity, and I would like to um, uh, go back to the previous question. I have a feeling that uh, by creating this contemporaneity that is a tabula rasa. You just look at the back, you just look at the past. Um, we end up um, looking at, uh, at, um, at your Biennale um, as, as basically the, the mastermind of uh, this reading of the past. And I wonder whether the cleansing of contemporaneity uh, might not be that productive. Sorry. Uh your uh, your questions became increasingly opaque uh, with with every next one uh, because and, uh, are you really suggesting that there's a connection between looking at history and tabula rasa? Did I understand that correctly? In that case, uh, uh, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's my first question because in that case, uh, I'm I'm uh, totally unable to answer. Uh, but let me answer your first question. I, that one I understood. Um, uh, yes, of course, um, anything that 
has a kind of repercussion or uh, a presence in the kind of public world uh, needs organization uh, and um, the, the Venice Biennale by definition because it is uh, so large in scale and so well known and receives so many visitors and is so ambitious probably for financial reasons to uh, to uh, be uh, visited by even more people, uh, a high degree of organization is almost inevitable. So you're confronting a highly organized uh, organism there. And I think that uh, uh, in, in, in this particular case, I had the luxury of not having to uh, invent the, the organization, but, but actually to uh, remove parts of organization and, and to dislodge uh, kind of certain expectations and simply to uh, uh, point them in a different direction. But I have to say that uh, the Biennale themselves were deeply aware of the, uh, had a kind of sense of crisis that they could not simply repeat uh, the same model again and again. Uh, and also that of course the Biennale itself uh, is now uh, mirrored by so many different Biennales that actually it was uh, of critical importance for them to offer something else. So in that sense, you know, it was uh, easy to, to find the kind of support for the change from the beginning. The second thing I don't really understand whether, know whether I understood you correctly. Um, at some point you have to be a realist and, and we were kind of confronted with the national pavilions as the kind of unit or the entity. Uh, that was there and that we could work with. And actually, as I tried to kind of suggest, working with uh, a model or a scale that uh, to some extent you could think of slightly outdated, uh, actually worked very well uh, for me and also kind of made me realize how critical that scale is. And it's, of course, uh, not a coincidence that uh, we are uh, in all our countries facing an enormous um, uh, hostility to exactly all those uh, international and larger organizations that you mentioned and an incredible pressure to kind of retreat uh, on uh, back to our own domains. So in that sense, uh, I think that the na nation state uh, had uh, a kind of strange relevance uh, also as something to take seriously. The third question, uh, maybe eventually, but uh, not now. Um, I have to uh, set the rule for the next um, one question, please. One next question, please. There's somebody here. With a microphone, please. It's coming in. What's the rule of the question, then, that you want to set? You said you, uh, you want just one question. Yes. Was that? OK. I was wondering. Um, when it comes to the elements of architecture, um, you have this factory, this glass factory, this windows factory, whereas windows as an element in architecture is really something that was changing tremendously throughout the last 150 years, like coming from a small hall, so to say, to really big facades. And like um, saying that even glass as a material is highly interesting because um, as the cultural anthropologist uh, Susanne Hauser is saying, we're not used to glass as such as a material because it was not there before and it takes several generations to get used to it. So I was wondering, it's such an interesting topic and you're just going like, you're sort of reducing it to the factory of, of windows. Why was that? I'm not reducing it to the factory of windows. Uh, everything that we kind of propose in the show is in relation uh, or against the background of the book. So the book is 2,500 pages, uh, 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 and uh, 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 out of which uh, I would say maybe 140 are dedicated to the window. So you can find all those entities, but uh, it seemed for us, uh, interesting to uh, not try to tell the whole story in, in every room, but to make, uh, uh, to contrast different uh, conditions and aspects so that the whole thing together gives you a kind of sense of the full rich richness. 
without uh, being actually confronted uh, with a book in three-dimensional form. Just a, a little um, a comment. The book will be present in the show, so uh, uh, all that that you don't see in the on the on the first uh, view can be can be experienced uh, by reading in in the show as well. Next question, please. Up there, somebody. Typology of bookshelves from the OMA would be actually an interesting subject also of research. I have also a question relating to the elements of architecture. Um, it seemed to me that you're treating them as per se, so single elements by in, in themselves, and I wonder if there will be some thoughts about the relationship between them, so how the wall meets the ceiling, or how the window sits in the wall, which is the, basically the architectural detailing, I would say, how the different elements meet together. My entire life, I've dedicated to, to a war uh, of architects' fetishism with details. Uh, um, uh, because I think that this one safe area in which they can kind of retreat, uh, be geniuses and, uh, and be irrelevant at the same time. Uh, and so uh, the answer is no. <laughs> Next question, please. There's, yeah, yes, please, yeah. yeah. I have a very simple one. Um, Gideon in the 50s said... Can you put it closer to your mouth, Gideon please? Gideon in the 50s said once that like, tra modernism stands still yet in like, the beginning of a grand tradition. And I wonder, studying 100 years of modernism for two years now internationally, do you still agree on it? Or do you feel a certain decay in culture? Or do you still see like directions modernism could develop in like a promising way sorry i wasn't able to listen because uh, at, at a certain point uh, people used to stand up so i didn't Aha, sorry uh, I, I didn't <laughs> i can't listen to no people i who wonder don't, who, I don't, who i don't see i mean in the 50s there were still um, Gideon at least or for quite a while they were very optimistic that they found now finally a formal way how architecture should be and how we can proceed into future. And these directions seem now becoming so generic, they get boring. And I wonder now, with like studying modernism in all countries for these two years, did you share now, do you share more now this opinion as well? Or you, did you find out new ways it could evolve? Well, Gideon is definitely one of the books that we, we had a close look at. You, you're referring, obviously, to Mechanization Takes Command, um, uh, and uh, for us, especially, the, the chapter on the bathroom um, uh, was, of course, highly uh, relevant. Of course, we, uh, at, um, uh, during this uh, almost two-year-long uh, research, we, we, we thought a lot about what, uh, how would Gideon uh, look at these things today, um, and um, uh, but at a certain point, we uh, we we try to give give up any um, uh, I would say um, any effort to be systematic. Um, even though also Gideon was very proud of of the gaps in in mechanization takes command. Um, at a certain point, we decided to look at the zooms. Um, uh, each element, each chapter, uh, was supposed to become a zoom um, and. Um, uh, I'm coming back to this point. What what happens when when the ramp looks at you? So we we, we don't we, we at a certain point we gave up any effort to be encyclopedic, complete or fair, um, um, but we we tried to find relevant uh, and, and narrations in each chapter. I don't know if this answers any of your questions. Yeah, I'm halfway, but it's okay. what you said in the discussions uh, with regards to digitalized homes, Snowden, etc. I wonder if in the old concept of the presentation there is not a certain spirit of nostalgia, uh, that a door remains a door, and a wall a wall, 
while in fact we have whole systems of surveillance and power and production at the moment. And if you name these systems with simple old-fashioned names, is there not um, some kind of nostalgia in it? Mm, I, um, I think that um, the, the, on, on my part, nostalgia is uh, kind of rarely uh, a, a drive. And uh, I think that uh, if you uh, look at the uh, question uh, that we pose to the individual countries, uh, to look at the period between 1914 and 2014. Uh, very few countries have a kind of reason to be nostalgic about that period. And, and I also kind of really discovered almost zero nostalgia for you know, any, any of those episodes. So their nostalgia is definitely not the motivation. Um, I think uh, in the elements of architecture, it is not so much nostalgia, but um, uh, a surprise to what extent uh, certain things that were uh, an inherent part of uh, uh, a profession or a culture are, are lost. So um, maybe everyone who uses the word lost uh, is already halfway uh, uh, immersed in nostalgia, but I, I don't necessarily think so. Uh, and it is also uh, definitely not the case that uh, the show uh, kind of uh, rejects everything that is modern or digital uh, at all. Uh, I can only say that kind of from my own experience as an architect, I was kind of really shocked to what extent this uh, work and this uh, kind of research showed in terms of the limited way in which I had myself uh, looked at architecture and looked at all these elements. This was really shocking to me to uh, kind of realize uh, that certain uh, questions uh, that, that would have been kind of very productive were simply never posed or that I had kind of adopted or accepted certain solutions without any, uh, as a kind of automatism or as a kind of inevitability. So uh, I don't think, uh, for instance, in my personal case, and you will see in the future uh, a return of wooden doors, uh, uh, but hopefully you will see a kind of more considered way of doing certain, treating certain aspects. So uh, that would be, you know, if, if you take me as a kind of prototype, that would be the emphasis of the exhibition. So um, when uh, I hear about uh, elements of architecture, I feel reminded of Gottfried Semper's theory of the four elements of architecture, which was kind of the founding thesis of uh, the architectural school here in Zurich. And for, for Semper, that was, of course, a very consistent theory, where the four elements were related to, to four technologies, four materials, and so on, that were exchangeable, that, that, but that was somehow a matrix that, that, that gave this theory a certain consistency. So I'm wondering about, you know, you can pursue this issue of the elements in terms of uh, typologies, in terms of structures, in terms of, uh, uh, of cultural anthropology, uh, material studies, and so on. So I'm just wondering, uh, do you have, a, a, or do you want at all, a kind of a consistent strategy to, to go after these issues, or you play with different possibilities in each and every of those rooms? So. We are, of course, aware of all these theories, um, starting from Alberti's uh, theory of six elements uh, uh, to, um, uh, to Semper, to Le Corbusier, and um, other efforts, or, or something. Uh, we, we try to be aware of, uh, of that, but uh, at a certain point, we, I think we felt the urge to forget about it. Um, um, because uh, we realized at, a, at one point that there's no way to come up with a with a finite definition of architecture that consists of, um, uh, of um, let's say, 14, 15, 16 elements. At the moment, we have a finite um, um, sequence of elements, but I think we both try to forget how many are they actually, and um, so there's no numerology behind it or no hidden meaning uh, behind the figure 14, 15, or 16. Uh, the, 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 the sum of the elements we are talking about uh, is the sum of the interesting stories we were able to find. Uh, 
Um, basically, the the first sentence uh, of my uh, introduction is nobody in their right minds would uh, uh, today uh, make a proposal how to put things together. Uh, and uh, it's really uh, an important declaration because, of course, we were totally aware uh, and as uh, Stefan says, there was a certain weight of that uh, expectation, but at the same time, uh, and that is what the kind of book uh, uh, shows in a kind of very uh, blatant way, simply not necessarily as an argument, by sheer weight of examples, that there are now so many extra architectural forces uh, involved in the decisions of uh, uh, how buildings are put together. So many issues that not are not remotely architectural, not remotely cultural, not remotely uh, connected to, uh, to, to any history, that uh, um, it, it really reveals the depth to which uh, 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 that world has gone. Yeah, and, and, and probably gone forever and, and probably you know, there's still enough remnants to, to be happy that it ever existed, but I think that collectively we, we are unwilling and unable to uh, uh, live in such a kind of constrained uh, uh, and coherent for, uh, world of values. That's, that's pr probably my, my, my kind of ultimate instinct uh, about this uh, thing. And I think that uh, um, you could, for instance, see that the kind of the issue of proportion has completely evaporated, kind of, from our profession. And uh, instead of proportion, we have dimension yeah, uh, and, and precision of dimension. So uh, it is uh, a really a documentation, uh, not so much of a decline and not so much of a loss, but of a totally different way of doing things. Um. I have actually only uh, left the possibility for one more question as I saw you. So that is, um, it's your turn. There's a microphone behind you, Ren. Uh, you mentioned very quickly that uh, many African countries will be represented this year. So I wonder whether there will be, or there is any attempt at um, addressing certain colonial architecture or if, if, if there is any desire to talk about the modernization of certain countries without the condition of modernity? Uh, as I said, uh, I, I, di I didn't influence the outcome. And, and so, uh, to be honest, I haven't seen uh, the content of African countries yet. Uh, and I only know that, as I showed, the Nordic uh, countries are uh, showing their involvement in Africa. There was an interesting Irish project to also show the kind of hundreds uh, of Irish church that the Irish had built in Africa. Uh, there are, um, but I, I'm, I don't, I can't answer your question. Yet you have to come and, and see, and I have to go and see uh, for a bit for myself. Sorry. That is already um, a nice um, conclusion, in fact. But however, I use the privilege of having the last question, uh, and um, um, just want to come back to one of your last phrases uh, in your presentation, where you were talking about the chapter of Montitalia and mentioning that. You somehow uh, also try with it to pull out the architecture of uh, its niche. Um, I think it was somehow also a hidden confession to uh, what you were trying to do almost always. But at the same time, a paradox to what uh, your exhibition in Venice uh, is uh, maybe supposed to become, because it is actually dealing with uh, the core business uh, and the core values of architecture. And as your life, uh, as you said earlier, your entire life was maybe uh, to some extent also a war uh, against the comfort zones uh, of architecture, um, is the hidden message maybe, or one of the hidden messages of uh, your exhibition that architecture has actually uh, stick to its profession? Has Again? To stick to its, uh, uh, no, I don't think, I, I, I don't think so, no. No, it's, it, it didn't uh, kind of lead on my part to kind of 
a huge uh, kind of embrace and 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 falling in love again with the architecture. Uh, <laughs> uh, too bad it would have been a, a romantic finish of this uh, conversation. But thank you very much, uh, Ram, for being here. Stefan, uh, thank you very much too. Uh, I think all of you wish you good luck for the next month and there will be a big surprise from June onwards uh, for all of us. And maybe we we'll see each other again in Venice. Thank you very much. The next conversation uh, will be in one month's time and I hope to see some of you again. Thank you very much.